for you is how do you see the, can you talk a little bit about the degree of change that you think would be best to implement and also the, the balance between having this economy and, and, and community rooted in uh, local, local communities and also being able to address some of these issues that are larger and scale. Right. Um, wow. That's a very good <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's been on my mind for about a week now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, first let me tackle local and global. Uh, we live in a global age, and I think many of us absolutely celebrate that. I myself have lived in uh, Africa, uh, Central America, Southeast Asia, uh, and, you know, glory in the acquaintance and knowledge of these wonderful different cultures. So I think our movement is a, uh, it's a global movement, it's a sophisticated uh, 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 movement that appreciates cultural differences and embraces them. So on the one hand, we're global, and we believe in global communication, and the way the Occupy movement has spread around the world, I think, is just you know, one of these wonderful things. Um, John Maynard Keynes once said, when, in terms of the economy, we ought to, we should not be shipping cookies from uh, England to India. We can just exchange the recipe. And I think that kind of captures it. Why should we be shipping stuff all over the world at increasing environmental and actual cost uh, when most things you can actually make uh, and consume far more? So one of the things I think we all really appreciate is the really flowering of farmers' markets and the growing sense of we ought to grow our food far, far more locally. Uh, importing butter from New Zealand, why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't do it. Um, New York grows apples. Well, eat New York apples. Don't get them from my state in Washington. That's just yeah. stupid. Um, <laughs> so the whole thing that we are coming to understand that our food ought to come more locally, our energy ought to come more locally, we ought to buy more locally, we ought to build more locally. Um, there's a movement that some of you may know about it, uh, called, there's of course green building. But there's kind of a, the next step on that is called the living building. Uh, and there's something called the living building challenge. And the idea is we need to build buildings that give back to the environment. It's like a plant. A plant gives off the oxygen. It gives back to the environment. It takes from the sun, takes from the soil, it adds to the soil, adds to the environment. That's what our buildings need to do. We need to have living buildings. So if we begin to kind of think of everything we do in those terms, we can be gloriously global, and you know our electronic age has allowed us to do that with, with some energy consumption. We can't pretend that it's not actually quite a bit, but um, still, we don't have to ship things around all the time to be, to be global. So that was one part of your question. So localize as absolutely much as we can, but maintain our global consciousness, our uh, communication, and our celebration of the diversity of the cultures in the world. Now, the other question is about the nature of social change. Well, I've been through a bunch of re revolutions in my life. Um, I went through, uh, I was in Nicaragua under Samosa, and then uh, the Sandinistas took over. And that didn't work out very well, frankly. It was not a very thoughtful revolution. It turned out. 
I was actually in the Philippines at the time Marcos. The United States government flew out Marcos. We actually did something good there. Um, and Cory Aquino rose, and I was there for <coughs> that transition. A pretty good transition. Not perfect, but not bad. Um, and uh, I was in uh, Ethiopia prior to the fall of Salafi, Salafi. And that transition was horrible. That was a nightmare. So anyway, these transitions can you know, take on a lot of different qualities. Uh, my favorite one, frankly, is the Philippines, which was a peaceful transition. Um, you know, as the military uh, began to kind of swarm into the crowds, there were like a million people in the streets in, in Manila in, uh, in February 1986. And uh, by that time, thank God, the church was on the side of the protesters. Much of the business community was. Not all of it, but a whole bunch of it. Um, as well as, you know, civil society. So you began to have fewer and fewer people on the side of the Marcus government. And the soldiers, of course, were themselves torn. Uh, here they're being told to kind of move in and control these crowds, just like the New York police are here. Uh, and they themselves are kind of like part of it. So you see that same uh, dichotomy here. And the nuns uh, in the Philippines would put flowers in the butts of the rifles. I mean, it was an amazing uh, uh, experience. And in the end, the military, the, the, the fear was that the military was going to bomb the crowd. That was the, on the table. Um, and they didn't. Um, and uh, there was a peaceful transition to Corrie Aquino. And she did a lot of good things. And the guy that followed her did a lot of good things. And then the guy that followed him did a lot of bad things. <laughs> so, hello, this is real world. But, it was a transition from a dictatorship to a democracy, and I can tell you, you can feel it when you are there. Suddenly, people can talk in a way they weren't able to talk before, and the notion of cooperatives, which was kind of suppressed under Marcos, just flowered. And, uh, you know, and then of course you also get politics and nasty politics and, you know, lots of stuff. But the, the freedom and the NGOs just flowered and, uh, so there's good and bad ways to do these things. And what makes the difference? Well, I, 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 I'm not sure, but because you have Ethiopia that was just her horrible dead bodies strewn in the streets for years and just a horrible regime that uh, was uh, kind of crazy. So how do you make sure you don't get the crazies and you do get, you know, I mean, Corey, who would have thought the, you know, she was the wife of an opposition leader and she turned out to be really calm and wonderful, smart, wise. Um, well, it's not just the, uh, it's not just the leader. We must not think that. Um, Stephen Zunis has written for Yes Magazine an earlier uh, issue on the effects of nonviolent revolutions compared to violent ones. And uh, the trick with the nonviolent ones is you're building the community structures all throughout the, the country before a big change happens. And then that makes all the difference. Because if you're, if everything could shoot them up, and that was true in Nicaragua, and it was true in Ethiopia, uh, then your leadership is a military leadership. And the uh, modus is uh, a military modus. And that tends to kind of wreck stuff. It's really trying to, to create peaceful structures that really work uh, over the long term. So, um, I highly recommend that article by uh, Stephen Zunas. I remember the name of it. But he reviews a whole lot of history.
on, on exactly this question. So this is, again, what's exciting about the Occupy movement, because you have these structures all throughout where people are learning to work together, listen to each other, to do general assembly, to have discussions about what is it we want. So this is a very hopeful uh, side to this movement that uh, potentially votes very well uh, for the victory.